Exploding flash drives today on Hack 5. Today we have the great pleasure of being joined by an awesome guest that you may know from the InfoSec Twitter universe for the amazing antics, be it, you know, jacking packages from Amazon door locks or exploding thumb drives, which we're talking about today. MG, dude, thanks for coming on. Nice to be here. It feels like this has been the longest time coming. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're getting there. It's going uh, to be a fun time. Right? So, uh, so mg.lol, if you're not aware, is one of my favorite InfoSec rock stars on Twitter, at underscore mg underscore. And you've just been doing basically the, 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 the hacker ethos <laughs> fun. The, I really want to know how much of this is like doing it for the lulz or whatever, but uh, what we're going to be talking about today is one of your projects that has you know, captured a lot of imagination, and that is exploding thumb drives. Yes. And I want to hear the story behind it because I feel like when we were talking about this in pre-show, it really paints the, the picture of your traditional hack, which is like, I got an idea. What do I need to learn to get that to work? Exactly. Uh, you know, rather than let me learn all the ins and outs of whatever this esoteric thing is, be it Linux systems administration or hardware engineering, and then applying it to something, you, you had this idea of let's make drives explode. Tell me about that. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I was on Twitter. I saw it was non-functional. It was just an empty shell of a USB drive. And in it, somebody had put a firecracker and maybe some sort of igniter that would immediately blow up as you plugged it in, in theory. I don't, I don't know if it ever worked, but that, uh, with myself and many people who saw it, you immediately get this visceral response to it. You're like, oh, that's horrible, but it's also awesome. You know, it kind of stuck in my head for a little bit. Yeah. And then I got the idea that, hey, what if I could combine that with a USB rubber ducky? Because then, you know, it would be actually, you know, dangerous on the, the computer side, and then it would also blow up. You could have some fun. And, Look interesting, um, and that's that's kind of how I started about this. That I mean, in very in very many ways, my like inner thirteen year old is reminded of downloading the Anarchist Cookbook or the Jolly Rogers Cookbook <laughs> on text files, and and making those. You remember those three and a half inch floppies oh, where you would take your, yes. your it, was, it was a really simple concept. You would t open up a floppy, you would douse it with your sister's nail polish, and then you would take match heads, strike anywhere match heads, yes. and you would just litter the thing with it, so that when you plug it into the drive and spin around, next thing you know, your your A drive is on fire. Exactly. Match uh, the the tennis ball with match heads in it, all that other stuff. That kind know. of stuff. <laughs> so so it very much is in the realm of the hacker hijinks, and I love that. And you're right. I think that is also the you know hits on another core theme, which is like, hey, that's cool. I can do it better. Which is like, well, okay, there's inherent flaws if the idea is you plug in the thumb drive and it immediately goes boom. Like I don't know about you. Your hand. I like my thumb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is true. So at least having a delay there. But um, so you yeah, said that yeah. the, the, the your next concept then was like, ooh, I want to do that with a duck. Tell me about yes. that. So I mean, naturally, the very first thing I did was see if I could do this with an actual Hack Five duck. Um, I got the idea that maybe I could use the LED that's on there as a trigger. I kind of got a little bit of control over it, but I quickly realized it was going to be a lot harder than I thought initially. And there's also the space limitation. Like mm. to, the, the ducky takes up most of the contents of a, of a thumb drive, so you need room for activities if you're going to put things that maybe blow up inside. Right. In fact, this actually isn't a duck here, but if we take a look at your traditional thumb drive, it kind of looks like that, and um, and a duck looks very similar just with an SD card yeah. reader in it. So, you know, you're right. There's, I mean, outside of maybe a little bit of room right here, but what you're trying to do is a much bigger boom. Yes. So you need a lot of this. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why I was led to, uh, to to talk about this with you on the program because, you know, over the years, I, I never would have imagined, you know, almost a decade ago, coming up with keystroke injection attacks and, and turning what was a you know, a, a Teensy or an Arduino-like dev thing into, you know, the, the household name that is the USB rubber ducky, uh, yeah. that, that and ducky script would become a de facto standard. Yep. And there's been, you know, so many, you know, knockoffs and stuff that are like, me too. Uh, <laughs> Lots. Different kind of me too. But, and it was like, okay, well, that's cool, but, you know, I want to see something way cooler and out there. And this is definitely way cooler and out there because I never <laughs> would have imagined. Uh, and then this is definitely not something that like, like standard warnings apply here. Uh, Don't you blow know, your I hands think, off. Yeah, DBAD, you know, uh, <laughs> rules apply. But otherwise, you know, this could definitely 
do what the ducky does in you know in a lot of professional settings you know talking to a lot of pen testers you know it, it's good in like dropping ducks everywhere and having them you know get a payload get a shell on a machine right but it's also really good at just demoing yes you know you, you plug it in in front of the, you know the CISO and then suddenly their eyes open and they're like oh we need to do something about our endpoint security <laughs> right so if you plug it in and it explodes awareness training yeah there you go awareness training <laughs> So oh. what was the journey though? Because looking at the final product here, uh, you, you clearly have engineering background and experience. Clearly, <laughs> no. Um, I've I've done light uh, electrical electronics work uh, in the past, you know, modifications and things like that of, of computer com components. But I had never made a PCB before. I had never put a lot of these components together before. Uh, I haven't done chip programming before. Um, all of these were. Um, required to get from, hey, an exploding ducky is a really cool idea to where, where I started. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's the, the summation of the journey, but let's, let's dive into it. Oh, yeah, so, so clearly, you know, you start with a prototype. You know, I did the same thing with a ducky. I was like, hey, let me find a, you know, a teensy uh, was my prototype. Uh, that was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Where did you start to prototype? Yes, exactly. I, I, I kind of went back to the Teensy and below, actually. So the Teensy, I believe, uses an 80 mega chip, similar to the, the Ducky, I believe. Is that correct, 80 mega? Sort of, it's an esoteric chip Close for enough. all, it's a weird chip, it's um, not for <laughs> So yeah, Atmel makes the AT Mega, that's a common uh, chip people are using for these types of things, but there's something called the AT Tiny, which is, as the name would imply, tinier. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's reduced uh, processing power, uh, memory, etc. but just enough to get basic ducky functionality out of mm -hmm. it. So uh, I started looking around for ways of sourcing this and you know, getting rolls of chips from China, it's a really slow process, it's expensive because you can buy it bulk. So I started looking for products that already have most of the compon components that I would need and uh, I kind of settled on a DigiDuck, or in this case, a DigiDuck clone, because they were relatively so, cheap. So it's actually a clone of a clone. So this right here is your kind of DigiSpark yes. clone guy. And so you're just like, what, sourcing the components off of there instead of trying to actually buy the components themselves? Exactly. Um, most of the board that I ended up with, uh, except for about two components, I harvest from this. It's also convenient because it's in ready to program form. It's got a bootloader on there. So that you know this speeds things up as well. Um, but at the same time, having that also creates issues down the line, as we'll talk about. Right, and then of course, you know, like many of these uh, knockoff knockoffs, you just gotta mm. buy like ten of them and hope a couple of them work. And yes, yeah, so about uh, two out of three of these tend to fail on me, um, if not immediately within the next two or three write cycles. So it's a little frustrating and um, makes it very hard to turn these into a, a mass scale project, as was eventually asked of me later. Mm. So let's let's go ahead and then get into the demo and see how this guy would then become that guy. Yes. All right. So uh, we've got the DigiSpark right over here. You can program that over the USB interface, which is nice and convenient. Up here on my screen, I have the very basic, close to hello world code that we're going to push down onto it. It's a pretty easy process here. It's so you just compile that. Yeah, it compiles. And then, and then it's just waiting for it. Yes, yeah, so we got about 60 seconds. Plug that in, and then it works. There it goes, detected, and it's actually going to launch. Oh, so it actually runs. Hey, hacks.lol. That's uh, Dan Tedler, Viz. Thank you. Way to go, Viz. I love this. is a beautiful demo, by the way, for getting hacked. So is Windows93.net. Just putting that out there. Um, awesome. Well, that's, that's fun as far as getting that on there, but that now means that there is going to be a five second delay yes. between when you plug it in and when it actually executes yes. every single time because it needs to be able to be programmed. Yes, that's how, that's how it uh, allows you to program it, is there is a five second delay upon insertion. If you catch it during that time, you can program it. After that, it executes whatever you have programmed it with. So for me as an endpoint device security company, I would just be like, oh, if you see anything that's an animal that wants to be programmed within five seconds, you just can kill that yep. thing. <laughs> anyway, that neither here nor there. Um, well, that's awesome though. So how do we get rid of that? Because clearly that's not what we're going to want. A uh, couple ways to do this. Uh, uh, SBI programmer, you would clip to the top of this chip and it allows you to modify the bootloader. 
Um, to do a bootloader, bootloader change, you need a 12-volt programmer. Uh, you know, we can, we can buy one of those. They're like 80 bucks, or you can kind of make one if you want. Yeah, but a, chip, a chip lobotomizer. Exactly. Um, the, the problem is that's not as much fun as another tool that's out there that allows you to introduce a NOP slide, uh, which is really fun. I would love to dive more into that, but from what I understand from this chip, it only being 8K. Yes. Right, so a portion of that is the bootloader. And then a portion of that is whatever your code is. And in yes. this case, since it's an Arduino code, that's, that's basically injecting keystrokes. Yep. So um, to modify that first 2K, yes. you just flash on basically an Arduino script mm -hmm. that what, tells it to tells it to nullify the bootloader? Yeah, so it, in the, the NOP slide situation, you don't need the 12 volt programmer. Um, you can do this just clipped onto the chip. And it effectively, it's, it's kind of like nulling the entire memory space of the actual bootloader. And it causes the, uh, the pointer that's trying to find where the bootloader is to slide all the way down into the user addressable space where there's a temporary bootloader that boots up, reflashes the chip and its own, and then uh, puts a, a, an additional bootloader into the actual bootloader space. So uh, it's a very hacky way yeah. to get a new bootloader on there that removes the, the uh, delay. Well, um, then, then how do you program it again if you don't yes. have that delay? Yeah, so you're gonna always, at that point, have to use the SPI clip to push new code onto your chip from the user addressable space with the uh, so, so whether or not you put that replacement bootloader on it with the NOP slide, Mm -hmm. or use the 12 volt SPI programmer, yes. you're still gonna need a 12 volt SPI programmer. Uh, an SPI programmer, uh, not necessarily 12 volt. 12 volt is gotcha. only for swapping out the bootloader. Ah, okay, cool. So the you don't have to buy an extra piece yes. of equipment if you just do it in software. Yes. That's pretty cool. And this, so one of the cool things about this chip is that it's five volts, but of course the data lines need to be 3.6 and this does it in a very hacky way. What exactly is on this chip that's doing that? Yeah, so right about here, we've got two different uh, Zener diodes. Uh, they're like a diode that performs slightly differently than a normal diode. Basically, you feed it backwards, and it acts like a voltage splitter. So Zener diodes will be rated at different voltages. These are 3.6 volt Zener diodes. And effectively, since this whole circuit is 5 volts, uh, the Zener diode shoves off anything over 3.6 volts to ground. Um, luckily, so does it just get hot? I mean, or, yeah. or what, what's the the byproduct? Exactly, because like, that doesn't sound like oh, yeah, we're just going to toss some voltage away. Like everything yes. will be fine. Uh, luckily, with the data lines, there's very little power running through them. So yeah, if we were running these on the data or uh, the main power lines, these things would just instantly smoke. There, there would be smoke everywhere. Uh, they would not work, and I actually mm. accidentally did that to a few. Yeah, and you can't get the smoke <laughs> back in the chip once it's come out, Yeah, from, a, from my experience at least. Luckily, I had, you know, two-thirds two of these uh, DigiSparks that were junk anyway, so, you know, har harvest, harvest uh, a few those energy diodes. Oh, fantastic. Exactly. But, uh, yeah, it's a, ha a hacky way to get 3.6 volts onto the data lines um, with kind of low tech and low cost. That's pretty cool. So I'm looking at this here, though, and, and the thing that's, that's standing out to me is, you know, I can see how you're like, okay, great, let me now attach a firecracker or whatever mm -hmm. have you to this and put it in a, in a USB drive, but... Uh, that was my initial thought. Yeah. Yeah. I'm seeing, I'm seeing a, a physical problem here. It's, uh, that's, that's no fitty. Yep. And actually, I, I had a couple different approaches. The first thing I did was... Yeah, put this, uh, I, I tried to trim down the sides of it. it didn't really work quite as well. Mm. It, was, it was just not happening. So ultimately I had to design my own uh, strip down circuit that removes a decent amount of the components on that board. I think I only took six components off of the DigiSpark and left the rest there. Okay, so you relayed it out. Is that where this comes in? What is this yes. guy here? So that's the remains of the, I think SMT Pads is the brand, but it's a it's a proto board. Uh, right. These are little. Uh, let's see if we can get that on the camera. Basically, it's a grid of copper squares. I think they're 50 mils each, tiny, but they line up with the legs of of the the actual IC. The chip. So, yeah. so basically, you harvested the IC off of this and stuck it on that, and then just relayed it out with. Well, it's it's almost like in a way, kind of like your traditional. Um, 
what is it called, like a, a breadboard. Yeah. Except without all the little legs, yes. you've got these pads, but then you'll have to then, what, create your own traces? How do you create your own traces yes. there? Yes. So just solder bits, just bridging them? Exactly. So, I mean, I was sourcing most of this off of Amazon, and, you know, I looked at this, it was, it, it was like, oh, those are really short runs. I think the, the gaps between them were about 10 mils, really tiny. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, surely I could just bridge it with solder. It was not working. Uh, not not in a reliable way that made it for a clean product anyway. Uh, so I got some copper tape I had for other projects. Started slicing little tiny, you know, 40 mil runs of that and making the actual copper traces where they needed to be. And that's kind of what led to the initial final product. Oh my gosh. This project. Is, this is brilliant though, because what I love about this is this is an example of how like, okay, look, I don't need to know all of these things because what I'm trying to do is get this. Uh, result. So let me learn the few things that I, as possible that I need to actually yep. put these pieces together. I know that this circuit needs to talk <laughs> to that circuit through this trace and it needs to be smaller. So yep. here you go and some tape and then you end up with something that's actually quite elegant. Uh, this guy, walk me through this. Yeah, so uh, here's kind of the initial final product here on the taped up proto board. I'm going to take this out just to show off a little more. So uh, we've got the primary AT Tiny on the top. We've got a MOSFET here. That was, that was my addition to it. Uh, the MOSFET is effectively a higher amperage switch. The legs on these, you can program to turn on and off, but they can't drive much. So this- So what do you have those tied into? Because, yes. yeah, you know, so you're sending voltage to the MOSFET, the MOSFET is doing what? Yes, so that's, that's the, uh, the payload, the five volt payload. So the code, there's additional code that I uploaded there. If you, if we look back to that, uh, it, it's turning pins on and off. Mm -hmm. This ties into one of the pins on the uh, the body of the the AT Tiny. Oh, okay. So instead of using the GPIO, you're using like what the LED or something? Exactly. So that that was the LED of. There, there's two LEDs on the uh, DigiSpark. Okay. There is a. Green one for the power and a blue one that is user programmable. And that's basically what I'm hooking into there. Okay, uh, so it thinks it's turning on an LED, but really it's feeding voltage to a MOSFET that's then, well, we'll get to that. Okay, so, yes. but, but <laughs> as far as putting this, relaying out this and, and uh, getting that package onto a smaller board, what all are all the components here to make that work? So there's a few resistors in here and that's for general USB compatibility, the USB spec is actually not super universal. It's kind of chaotic. They help compatibility within other machines. Some people can actually manage to run without this if your machine is highly tolerant. I wanted compatibility. And then of course there's the two uh, Zener diodes there to put 3.6 volt, uh, volts onto the data lines. And we'll flip this back over. You'll see some uh, tape that actually goes around the outside, you, you can't actually do oh that with a normal gosh. PCB. So that's hey. one of the cool things. So instead of drilling a hole or yes. something, you actually just... Goes around the perimeter yeah. without having to go through the boards. So then on the other side, there's the AT Tiny and the brains of it. And then we've got a the MOSFET and a little resistor to help the MOSFET do its thing. So the MOSFET is feeding the voltage though through you know this wire here, but there's something exposed here. What is this? Yes, up, up here. Uh, that's basically a resistance wire. There's, there's many things you can do. This specific uh, payload is set up to make something blow up or do the cool smoke effects that you saw. Uh, they, they need heat to start. This provides the heat. Um, okay, so essentially this is like what the same kind of stuff you'd find in like a... Like a Kind of like a, a vaporizer. Lighter, a va yeah. vaporizer. Yeah, and cigarette lighters, vaporizers. It, it'll glow when you provide uh, enough amperage to it. Right, and then so then you just shove it inside of the plastic case with a firecracker and, and call it a day yes. as long as you're not in the state of California. Yes. Let's go ahead and demonstrate Mr. Self-Destruct plug into a USB extension here to this here Mac. And I love that your payload just opens up hacks.lol. Thank you, Viz. Oh, whoa. You can see it like glow red and then there was like even a little bit of smoke. That's the heat you need to make fun things happen. <laughs> okay, enough rocking out. Um, that was fantastic. I mean, I think if you plug this into your computer and, you know, there's a... Uh, is that Pop-Tart Goat? If there's a Pop-Tart Goat dancing around on your screen that says, lol, hacks, <laughs> and your thumb drive has exploded, you might have been hacked. Might happen. <laughs> or, uh, or at least you've convinced upper management to uh, maybe... Uh, 
Hey, we got some money for some endpoint device security. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Either way, it sounds like a lot of fun. Man, this has been a blast, and I know that there is so much more to this. Uh, I would love to have you on again to dive into some of the other stuff because I know you've done like, custom PCBs and this beautiful story of like, I want to hack something. <laughs> Quick, start shoving things in until something comes out. It's beautiful. Let's do it. All right. Uh, MG, where can people find uh, like, you know, build tips and uh, any of the other stuff related to this project? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I've got a website, mg.lol. Um, also up on Twitter, uh, underscore mg underscore. Uh, both of those places, I post, post a lot of stuff. Um, and those would be good places to find me. Awesome. Dude, appreciate you coming down. This has been a lot of fun, uh, especially like, you know, tweaking with it behind the scenes. <laughs> and um, I learned a lot and I'm excited for what can come. So with all that said, you can find the show notes over at hack5.org as well as all the other shows. And MG, of course, on Twitter at underscore MG underscore. Uh, with that, I'm Darren Kitchen. MG, you know how we end this? Trust your, you trust your criminal instincts? I don't know. <laughs> no, we say trust your technical ones. <laughs> I know, I know. That's, and this is exactly why. <laughs> Domain.com has all your website needs, from .com and .net domains to intuitive website builders, so you can take that first step in creating your online identity. Let me tell you, there's no domain extension like a .com or a .net, or if you want to brand yourself, Domain.com has over 300 domain extensions like .club and .space. These guys are huge fans of Hack5. They're affordable, reliable. We've been using them for years. They've got all the tools you need to share your ideas with the world. And because they're such big fans, they are hooking you up with 15% off their already affordable prices. So get domain names and web hosting and email, and just be sure to use that coupon code HAK5. So when you think domain names, think domain.com.